Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Active Probes. In this presentation, we'll provide you with a short technical introduction to single-ended active probes, as well as explain why they are commonly used in certain oscilloscope applications. In this presentation, we'll occasionally refer to passive probes. If you're not already familiar with passive probes, or if you'd like a brief refresher, you may want to watch the presentation, Understanding Passive Probes, before beginning this presentation. Let's start with a brief review of passive probes. As the name implies, passive probes are unpowered. They consist of a pair of conductors with a parallel resistance and capacitance in the probe tip, as well as a variable capacitor for compensation at the scope attachment point. Like most other probes, passive probes are specified by an attenuation factor and a bandwidth. Because of the capacitance in the probe tip, the impedance of a passive probe decreases with increasing frequency, and therefore passive probes are most often used for low frequency and or low bandwidth applications. Typical passive probes have an input attenuation factor of 1, 10, or 100 times, and bandwidth of up to about 500 MHz or more, although bandwidth also tends to be a function of the probe's attenuation factor. So what is an active probe? Generally speaking, active means that the probe requires power. Recall that passive probes do not require a power source. Using this definition, differential probes, and most types of current probes, are also active, since these two types of probes also normally require power. However, for most oscilloscope users, the term active probe refers more narrowly to a single-ended FET probe, and in the remainder of this presentation, we'll also use the term active probe to refer to this specific type of probe. As the name implies, an active probe has active or powered components, in this case usually a FET or field effect transistor in the probe tip. One of the greatest advantages of an active probe is that it has minimal loading over a wide frequency range. The very low input capacitance of an active probe translates into a high input impedance. We'll cover both of these topics in more detail later in this presentation. Another advantage is that active probes can provide a high input offset, another topic we'll cover in detail in a few moments. Active probes usually have a proprietary connector, so the scope can automatically detect and calibrate the probe. Power to the probe may be provided over this proprietary interface, or may be supplied externally. Note that most active probes require the scope channel to be set to a 50 ohm termination. And although this presentation discusses the use of active probes with oscilloscopes, some active probes can also be used with other types of instruments, for example with spectrum analyzers. On the previous slide, we briefly touched on three important characteristics of active probes, namely loading, bandwidth, and offset range. Active probes have significant advantages over passive probes in all three of these areas, so let's take a few moments to explain each of these in more detail. We'll start with loading. Ideally, an oscilloscope probe should not become part of the circuit under test, and also should not distort the measured signal as seen on the oscilloscope. However, if the probe has a low input impedance, it can load the circuit. This means that current flows into the probe causing the measured waveform to become distorted. In addition, loading may cause the behavior of the circuit to change when the probe is attached. Loading due to oscilloscope probes is primarily due to the probe's capacitance. If the probe has an excessive amount of input capacitance, this will distort the signal. Higher frequency components become attenuated, and this attenuation will affect the amplitude and the shape of the measured waveform. One of the advantages of active probes is that they can reduce circuit loading. The amplifier in the tip of an active probe enables active probes to have very low input capacitance. Traditional passive probes have input capacitances in the range of tens of picofarads, whereas the capacitance in active probes is commonly single-digit picofarads or less. This lower input capacitance means the probe has a higher input impedance, and therefore lower circuit loading. For example, 
the amount of ringing is significantly higher with passive probes than with active probes. This is especially true at higher frequencies. Active probes are therefore often a better choice when connecting to high impedance circuits that would otherwise be significantly loaded by passive probes. The next topic is bandwidth, more specifically probe bandwidth. Like oscilloscopes, probes also have a bandwidth, which is the frequency range over which the probe can accurately measure signal amplitude. This is usually defined as the frequency at which the measured amplitude is 3 dB lower than the actual signal amplitude. Generally speaking, the bandwidth of a probe should be at least one and a half times the needed scope bandwidth. That is, if our application required a scope bandwidth of 500 megahertz, we would want a probe with 750 megahertz of bandwidth. Greater scope bandwidth means that there's less attenuation of higher frequency signals or signals with higher frequency components. This is important for signals with different frequency components since waveform distortion is usually the result of unequal attenuation of signal components. On average, active probes have much higher bandwidths than passive probes. While most passive probes have bandwidths in the range of tens or hundreds of megahertz, active probes often have bandwidths well into the gigahertz range. The bandwidth of any probe is related to that probe's loading. Remember that loading will increase rapidly at higher frequencies if a probe has a high input capacitance. And as we mentioned earlier, the design of active probes gives them a low input capacitance and thus lower loading at high frequencies. Therefore, active probes are recommended for signals that are high frequency and for signals that have fast rise times or significant harmonic content such as square or pulse signals. The last topic we'll cover is offset range. A good general rule when using an oscilloscope is that the signal of interest should be both vertically centered in the display as well as scaled to fill most of the screen. This maximizes the use of the scope's ADC or analog to digital converter. It can however be challenging for signals with small AC components and a large DC offset. For example, when measuring the amount of ripple on the output of a DC power supply. One solution is to enable AC coupling on the channel in order to remove or block the DC component. But this also removes the ability to see drift, etc. Another approach is to apply an offset to the channel so as to vertically center the signal. After this offset has been applied and the signal has been moved to the center of the display, the volts per division setting can be decreased to see the AC component of the signal in more detail. An important limitation to this approach is that the maximum offset range is limited by the vertical scale setting. Small volts per division settings reduce the maximum configurable offset range. Many active probes have the ability to apply an offset within the probe itself. This offset is separate from, or in addition to, the offset range in the scope, and is also independent of the scope's volts per division setting. This means that probe offset can be used to vertically center the signal in the case where scope offset is not sufficient. Because probe offset is not limited by the volts per division setting, using probe offset enables greater vertical sensitivity when looking at signals with large offsets. This in turn improves the achievable vertical resolution and the ability to see and or measure smaller signal details. Let's end with a brief summary. Single-ended active FET-based probes have many advantages over standard passive probes. They have lower input capacitance and thus do not load the circuit as heavily as passive probes. They have higher bandwidth. And they also can provide a high offset range. All of these advantages mean that active probes are a good choice for signals which have high frequency components. Since active probes are active, they require power, and in most cases, these probes have a proprietary scope interface for both power as well as control and configuration. Active probes have many advantages over passive probes, but they're also considerably more expensive, have a lower voltage range, and also tend to be less physically robust.
This concludes our presentation, Understanding Active Probes. If you'd like to learn more about probe types, oscilloscopes, or Rodian Schwartz test and measurement solutions, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.